Greetings and welcome to worship here with us at St. Luke's. We are excited and delighted that you've chosen to worship with, worship with us online on this seventh day, Sunday after Pentecost. Today we also lift up our 2021 graduates, both high school, college, and post-secondary. I am Pastor Sally Hansen. I will be your presiding minister today. Pastor Richard Johnson is away on vacation. Our guest preacher today is recent graduate Claire Emble. Claire graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We are joined by our musical director, Ann Krentz Organ, as well as our prelude today by our handbell quartet and our postlude by organ student Ethan Melma, who recently graduated from Lawrence University. Our cantors today are Elisa and Chris Ramsey, and our reader is Janet Wazalewski. A few announcements for this day. Next Sunday, July 18th, as a part of our normal Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m., we will be having a healing service. You are invited to come and be a part of that. Also, starting this week on Wednesday, Pastor Johnson will be leading a book video Bible study around the black church in America. It comes from a recent PBS special. Each portion of it will be available each week, so please come and join us on Wednesday evenings moving forward. Folks looking for prayers today include Jim, Kurt, Don, Joe and Jerry. We lift up all of our graduates from this spring or those who will graduate later this summer. We are reminded once again that we do not have a permanent place on this earth as we grieve alongside the friends and family of Ryan Knapp. Ryan is the son of Jim Knapp, a member here at St. Luke's. We lift up this day, you, our members, those of you who are joining us for the first time or the millionth time. We are grateful that you are here and that you've been called to join worship with us this day. We also lift up all of those we name in our hearts. Our great worship continues with the prelude.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to be with you. I'm so excited to be here and to have all of you with me. This morning, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our second reading, which comes from Ephesians. And the story talks about adoption. And so I asked my cousin Coraline, who was adopted in 2019, if I could borrow her book. And this book is called Allie's Big Book of Friends by Chloe Lee Banks. And it tells the story of a little girl named Allie whose babysitter is going to have a baby. And she's choosing to give that baby up for adoption. And so it follows along as Allie learns about what adoption is. And she learns that some pretty famous people are adopted. And so she learns about my personal favorite, uh, Olympic gymnast Simone Biles, who was adopted by her grandparents, and people like Superman that were adopted by families here on Earth. She learns about President Bill Clinton, who was adopted by his stepfathers, and Steve Jobs, who was adopted as a baby, as well as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, who were adopted, and country singer Faith Hill. Allie also shares a little bit about her grandmother who encourages her to read the Bible. And Allie talks about Moses, who was put in a basket and sent down the river by his mother so that he could be safe. And he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised in Egypt. Allie also talks about Jesus. She writes, Jesus was adopted too. His dad is God, but God lives up in heaven. So God made Mary and Joseph his parents to take care of him and love him. God sure must like adoption if two of the most famous people in the Bible, Jesus and Moses, are both adopted. And I realize God does like adoption. In our reading from Ephesians today, Paul writes, God destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ. This was God's good pleasure and will. And what I learned from Allie and from our reading today is that adoption means that you're surrounded by more love. 
When you're adopted on earth, your birth family loves you and your adopted family loves you. And what I learned is that God also adopts us. Through baptism, through our church community, we get to be surrounded by our love from people here on earth that we can see and feel, maybe at home or at school or here in church. But we also get to be surrounded by love that we can't always see because we're connected to a huge family that God has destined for us through Jesus. And I think that's super cool. And so if you would just say a little prayer with me before we finish up, you can fold your hands and bow your head if you'd like. Dear God, Dear God thank you for adoption. Thank you for adoption. Thank you for families of all kinds. Thank you for families of all kinds. For being our holy parent. For being our holy parent. And for loving us all the time. And for loving us all the time. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, you guys. A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, holding a plumb line. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from its land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a shepherd and a dresser of the sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that before God we should be holy and blameless in love. God destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ. This was God's good pleasure and will, to the praise of God's glorious grace, freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of God's grace lavished on us. With all the wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of the divine will, according to God's good pleasure set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the divine counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of God's glory. In Christ, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, the praise 
of God's glory. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to marry your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When Herod heard John, he was greatly perplexed. And yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came. When Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee, when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? The mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. The soldier went and beheaded John in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. For most people, the martyrdom of John the Baptist isn't an unfamiliar story. We know that it ends with this gruesome image of the prophet's head on a platter, but today, I don't want to talk about where our story ends up. I actually want to talk about how we got there. John the Baptist is in jail at the direction of King Herod for condemning the adultery of Herod and his wife Herodias. John had been reminding them that their marriage was unlawful because Herodias was actually married to Herod's brother Philip. And this angered her so much so that she wants to kill John the Baptist, but she knows she can't. So she settles for his imprisonment until an opportunity arises. King Herod throws himself a lavish birthday party with lots of distinguished guests, and Herodias' daughter performs a dance that pleases Herod so much, he offers her anything she desires. And her mom tells her to ask for John the Baptist's head. And she does, Herod grants it, and John the Baptist is murdered. The story is uncomfortably simple. And I found myself asking why it's so easy for these characters to commit murder. Who's to blame? Surely it's Herodias because this was all her idea. But the daughter should have known better than to ask for murder. And if not, then Herod should have at least known better than to give in to her. And maybe it's just the guard who actually committed the beheading. But also there were dozens of witnesses and no one said anything. I kept thinking to myself, there has to be a villain in the story, right? And I wrestled with this for a little bit until I realized that it's not an individual person or even this specific group of people that is to blame. It's a system, a power structure that allows this to occur. This kind of government-sanctioned injustice was so common in the Bible. Years before this, Herod orders the murder of all male babies under two after he hears a Messiah was born. And years after this, the Romans go on to crucify Jesus, an innocent man for his teachings and willingness to go against societal norms. 
The story feels so simple because no one has to think twice about what they're doing. This is normal, and not just for them. This feels incredibly relatable to us too. Like our Bible characters, we live in a world of unjust structures, many that go unnoticed and feel all too easy. And so instead of thinking about blame or individual sin today, we have to do a deeper self-reflection and ask three questions. Who are we in the story and in the system? Who do we want to be instead? How do we get there? Who are we in the story? Who do we want to be instead? And how do we get there? Who are you in the story? I'm not suggesting that any of us would behead somebody, but I am encouraging all of us to think about how we play a role in systems and structures that hurt people. Are you the silent and complicit party guests that don't speak up despite witnessing injustice? Maybe they're scared. Maybe they're thinking it's not my business, not my job. Are you Herodias, letting anger consume you and blaming someone else for your sins? Are you her daughter that fails to question her actions and ignores the consequences? I personally find myself most connected to Herod. Mark tells us that Herod was deeply grieved, meaning that he knew that executing John the Baptist was wrong and he even felt pained by it. Mark goes on to say that yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her, meaning that people are watching and Herod doesn't want to go against their expectations. Herod chooses his own ego, popularity, and favor in the court of public opinion despite being deeply grieved and knowing the right thing to do. I see Herod in myself every time that I choose to respond to a call from my own ego instead of a call from God. It's every time I pick myself, pick convenience, pick comfort over right relationships with God and others. It can be as simple as knowing that a company or corporation doesn't have ethical human rights practices, but getting sucked into that super easy add to cart two day free shipping and shopping anyway. I know it's wrong and I still do it. And I also know that there are gonna be certain things that are just unavoidable and certain unjust systems that we are active parts of, but I, I believe that it's still worth it to think about how we can be different. So who do you want to be instead? I wanna be a party guest that instead of complicity, recognizes that anything that hurts another part of God's creation as a Christian is my business. And unlike the daughter in our story following the norms immediately, I wanna think critically and ask questions, even if it means going against the people closest to me. I want to be brave enough to choose God's justice and radical love, to be a version of Herodias that instead of choosing anger and placing my faults on the backs of others, chooses accountability. I want to be able to admit when I'm wrong and do better next time. I want to be a leader, unlike Herod, that picks God over power, over money, and over ego, regardless of the opinions of others. And the hardest part is how we get there, because that's a really tall order. And for a lot of people, I think it seems like an idyllic dream and not an attainable reality. But this was the part of my sermon writing where I stopped to think about how brilliant the people who write the lectionary are, because the answer, or at least the start of an answer, is right there in our first reading. We work to be more like Amos. The Lord gives Amos the vision of a plumb line. A plumb line is a pretty simple tool that works similarly to a level. It was just a weight attached to a string attached to a small plank that was placed on walls to make sure they were built centered and upright. The plumb line for Amos, though, is not a literal tool for wall building. It's instead to measure the righteousness of social structures. And we know this because the prophet Isaiah says it several books earlier as a part of the judgment on corrupt rulers and priests and prophets. In chapter 28, Isaiah writes that God says, See, I am laying in Zion a foundation stone a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. One who trusts will not panic, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. God calls Amos to preach justice into Israel, to teach people how to be in those right relationships with each other and with God. 
But in order to do that, their current structures would need to change. And obviously that did not sit right with the people in power. Amaziah tells King Jeroboam that Amos is conspiring against him and the land is not able to bear his words, meaning the people are not ready for change. But there's never been a change in history that a nation was willing and ready to accept. It was something that had to be fought for. Getting to where we want to be is a journey filled with struggle, and the answer to how we get there is to be like Amos. We don't have to be prophets. We can be lowly shepherds that just do our best to follow the Lord's call. In 2019 and 2020, the ELCA celebrated 50, 40, 10. That's 50 years of white women being able to be ordained and hold leadership in the church, 40 years of women of color being able to do the same, and 10 years of LGBTQ people being openly affirmed and ordained in the church. Those changes only happened because brave voices were willing to stand up like Amos and be the versions of characters I wanted to see in our gospel today. They spoke up, they thought critically, they held themselves and each other accountable, and they sacrificed popularity, jobs, relationships, and more because they knew that our structures were not measuring up to the full justice of God's kingdom. And I get to be here as a living embodiment of that struggle. And I celebrate and thank God for that every day, while also knowing that there are still unjust structures in our world that need rebuilding. And maybe you don't feel fully ready or know exactly how to be like Amos, or what part you're supposed to play in this fight to straighten the plumb line of justice. But a really powerful first step is to have a conversation with God. Our hymn of the day tells us that God heeds the prayers within our tears. You can start the conversation from crying. You can start from overwhelmed. And when you're ready, listen for where God is calling you to be and ask God for courage like the kind that Amos had. And in all of this, the best news is that Ephesians already reminded us that in all of that really difficult work of trying to be like Amos, becoming our best selves and overturning the unjust systems, we are surrounded by the riches of God's grace and supported by an adoptive family of unending love. Amen.
Today, we are lifting up our 2021 graduates with recognition and a blessing. Let us pray. God of joy and hope, we thank you for this time of graduation. Your spirit of wisdom has empowered hard work and discipline in such a way that our hunger for learning has been nourished with knowledge, discovery, creativity, and determination. As you walked across the stage to receive your diplomas in person or virtually, we hope you walked in prayerful gratitude for the many blessings that have made this moment real and filled with great potential. In gratitude, we pray for families, our parents, siblings, and children, and many who have sacrificed and worked to see us to this hopeful moment. In gratitude, we pray for teachers and administrators who have challenged, cared, and crafted us along this academic journey. In gratitude, we pray for fellow students who have taught us more about friendship, collaboration, and sharing. God, even as we have faced many challenges in this past year and accomplished much, we understand that our lives move into a new chapter where there will be more challenges to face and more will be demanded. May your grace cover these anxieties and fears so that we may stay encouraged about the future. Give us courage to face the challenges of carving out a place in society where we might live in peace, service, and gratitude. Give us strength to resist the temptations of greed, pride, and envy as we strive to do and be our best. May this celebration be a reflection of the blessings we find in knowing and loving you, O God. Amen. Let us honor our graduates with a round of applause and acclamations. Let us come before the triune God in prayer, responding to each petition with the words, hear us and help us. O oh God, bless the church throughout the world. Uphold bishops, pastors, deacons, chaplains, and leaders of monastic communities. Protect from danger and contagion everyone who attends church camps throughout the summer and provide meaningful worship for the campers that we might nurture one another in baptismal life. O oh God, hear us and help us. Bless the earth, moderate the intense heat, give shade and breezes to all, and send necessary rain to nourish the crops. Preserve farm laborers as they work each day under the sun. That your creation will survive and thrive, O oh God, hear us and help us. Bless the leaders of nations, crush the might of tyrants, train those in power to care for all the oppressed in their land, lead wealthier countries to share the COVID vaccine with poorer nations, protect whistleblowers and journalists, and form us into persons without prejudice against others. That the nations might know peace and justice, O oh God, hear us and help us. Bless all who live without power or status. Free the poor, especially youths, from every form of enslavement. Grant security and self-determination to indigenous peoples around the globe. That all people might live in dignity, O oh God, hear us and help us. Visit all who are imprisoned and accompany all persons who are facing capital punishment. Bless all who are sick or suffering, Comfort the survivors of disaster or gun violence. Protect us from the Delta variant of the coronavirus. Receive our prayers for Jim, Kurt, Don, Joe, Jerry, 
and those we name in our hearts. That all people might experience well-being, O oh God, hear us and help us. Bless each of us that throughout this week we may pray and work in your name. Watch over all graduates as they discern the next great adventure in their life and in their faith formation. Accompany us in this time of discernment and transition as we move through the pandemic and look to the future. We join in celebrating the marriage of David and Jessica yesterday. Be with all the people of St. Luke's near and far and receive our silent prayers. That each of us might live as your adopted child, O oh God, hear us and help us. We bless you for all who are near death, that you walk with them on their final journey. For all who have died, especially Leanne's family at the time of her death, and for the Jim Knapp family at the time of Ryan's death. Bring comfort to all who mourn the loss of a loved one, especially as we remember them before you hear. As one day we gather in your presence in heaven, fulfill your promise to us of life together in your presence, that we may be gathered up with all the saints in Christ, O oh God, hear us and help us. Receive these prayers, merciful God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them. them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the company of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God triune, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Over the eons, your merciful might evolved our home, a fragile tree of life. Here, by your wisdom, are both life and death, growth and decay, the nest and the hunt, sunshine and storm, darkness and light. Sustained by these wonders, we creatures of dust join in proclaiming, the earth is full of your glory. 
O triune God, you you took on our flesh in Jesus, our healer, and Christ, bring life from death. We remember his cross. We laud his resurrection. Broken like bread, he enlivens our body. Outpoured like wine, he fills the earth with goodness. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all, gave it all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered around this table, we proclaim the earth is full of your glory. Send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Strengthen us for our journey with this meal, the body and blood of Christ. Give us a future that trusts in you and cares for your earth. Amen. Gathered into one in the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Christ has set this table with more than enough for all. Come, eat, and be satisfied. All, all are welcome here. At this time, you are invited to receive communion, hearing these words, the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. 
body of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace, peace be, be with, with you. you.